This episode of The Capsule in Conversation is brought to you by Harrogate Spring Water. Famous for its waters since 1571, Harrogate is Britain's premium natural source water. Hello everyone, you are listening to The Capsule in Conversation podcast. I'm Natalie Anderson and today I'm talking the realities of perimenopause how it can affect pregnancy, and how to navigate this tricky transitional season with author and nutritionist, Emma Bardwell. So sit back, relax, and get ready to join us in our conversation. I hope you're all well and have had a fabulous week. I cannot believe that this is the penultimate episode of this series. I mean, come on, where has the time gone? But all good things must come to an end. Is that really true? Could it be that when something ends, it's the start of something even better than before? Well, my guest today certainly knows a thing or two about welcoming the next phase. As the author of The Perimenopause Solution and one of the leading nutritionists in hormonal and menopausal health, she is the wonderful Emma Bardwell. Hi, Emma. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so thrilled to have you. Honestly, we've got so much to talk about, so many questions. Um, Firstly, though, your book, the menopause solution is an absolute game changer. You know, about two years ago, I didn't even know what the perimenopause is and I just turned 40, which is crazy because I'm likely to be going through some of those early changes. And none of my friends, none of my age group really had any idea about this until I started banging the drum and going, you know, it could be perimenopause. It could be, you're feeling forgetful or you know, you're more anxious than normal. And was it your personal experience um, going through this kind of time that prompted you to write the book with Dr. Uh, Shazadi Harper? Yeah, so it was a combination. It was a, I started experiencing perimenopause symptoms around the age of 42, which my GP was very quick to tell me, uh, you know, was, was too early. And, and that is what a lot of women in their 40s will experience. They will go, you know, because we are talking about it more. So I do I do think that women are more aware. There's still lots of work to be done. But, you know, they will go with a list of symptoms and they will be told categorically that, you know, there's no way you can be perimenopausal because A, you're still having periods, uh, you know, and B, you're too, you're too young. So that was my experience. So it was mm-hmm. from that point of view, but also the fact that I was just seeing so many young women, you know, coming into clinic and not knowing what was happening to them. So they were falling, they were feeling, you know, totally kind of flummoxed by this catalogue of symptoms, which I'm sure we'll go into, um, and not, not, not getting the help that they wanted. So yes, the book was very much predicated on trying, my mantra has always been, you know, to, to be prepared, not scared. So Mm -hmm. I know you said that you were terrified about this kind of prospect. And I think lots of younger women do feel really, you know, they feel really scared by it. Um, And there's no need that there there isn't any need. Well, this is the thing. It's the, it's the picture that that has been painted of women before, you know, and obviously we've got amazing women really working hard to change that, you know, like Davina, like people that are just showing that actually this is, and Lisa, we had Lisa Snowden on right at the beginning of this series, who's just phenomenal. And I'm like, thank you for all the information because it's women like her that are helping women like me have these conversations uh, with just that slightly younger audience. And um, but something that I, I saw the other day on television and it blew my mind was that not all doctors have studied the menopause when they qualify as a GP so I mean that's insane when you consider that half half of us will go through this and yet your GP could have actually qualified as a doctor without having studied that area yeah it it's, elective. It's, it's, it's elective so if you're not, if your GP doesn't know you know if as when you're training you didn't really have an interest in that then yes your 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 kind of understanding is nominal and GPS I think they get a really 
they get a really hard time, don't they? There's a lot of yeah. GP bashing going on and we have to remember that they are incredible and they've got this huge spectrum of knowledge. They can't know everything. But yes, you're absolutely right. A lot of women are slipping through the net because they are going, you know, thinking that, think, trying to explain what's happening to them uh, and it, it's not being recognised. This is the thing for me personally. I think, as you said, GPs work so incredibly hard and they do. We need to make, we need to have that section put into the general training because just as they would with, you know, with pregnancy or with puberty or it needs to just be part of that general training. And this is the thing why I feel like I have been scared of it because there's this secrecy or this not knowingness yeah. with it, which I'm thrilled that actually we are able to have these conversations. And um, as you were saying there, you know, some of the, the symptoms, just talk me through some of these early symptoms in perimenopause. Yeah. So just, sorry, just really quickly looping back. Mm. There is, GP training is getting better because of people like Louise Newson, who is this kind mm. of, you know, huge menopause warrior. And she is actually, uh, putting out lots of free GP training. So, you know, GPs can then elect to take part in this training. So I do think things are shifting. Mm. And I think obviously the Davina effect is, is changing things too. We are talking about it more, but yeah, lots of, uh, you know, lots of work still to be done. So in terms of symptoms, the obvious ones are things like hot flushes and night sweats and wet, you know, weight gain, things like that. But there, there's lots of the kind of psychological symptoms aren't, these are the ones that really floor women. Mm. And these are the ones I think that don't get picked up uh, and recognised or talked about enough. So, you know, lots of anxiety and mood swings and kind of lack of confidence. Um, there is a real kind of propensity towards insomnia. And all of these things kind of play into each other, don't they? Because if you know, if you don't sleep well, you are going to feel, you know, really, really lousy. And then you start making kind of poorer lifestyle choices in terms of nutrition, in terms of, you know, exercise. Quite often when you're tired, exercise is the first thing to go. And actually exercise, it, you know, it's not just about managing weight, which I think a lot of women do kind of associate it with. It's to do with mental health. And, and I, that is an area that we really, really need to kind of really look after, I think, particularly when you're first heading into perimenopause, looking after your mental health is key. Yeah, completely. And I know so many women who are uh, like in the kind of 45 to 50 bracket who were given antidepressants earlier on because as you said they slipped through the net a bit really and and then other things have happened and you think oh I wonder if that could have been different if if they'd have known or if they'd have been able to be you know prepare their body a bit better just again with that education around this you know um I, I think so many women and because this is a particularly busy time in our lives as well you find most women are probably getting to the peak of their career they might be juggling children or they might not but they're in the that kind of career driven focus uh they've got bills to pay because they've got houses or cars or whatever it is but they're in that very busy period and so it can easily be oh it's stress and actually it might not be stress it could be more at play yes yes well I mean stress factors a lot because stress can actually it doesn't bring on symptoms but it can really exacerbate them and you're right we are this kind of sandwich generation where we are perhaps looking after oh you know older relatives maybe we've you know women are having children much older now you know so it potentially I mean I had my second child when I was 40 so I and then I went into perimenopause at, perimenopause at 42 so you know there was a ton of things going on uh, and I think we also need to remember that it doesn't just happen and I think this is a kind of misnomer it, menopause doesn't happen overnight or even mm. perimenopause it's a very kind of insidious gradual process that quite often can start as early as your late 30s uh but you know I think for women in their 40s even if you are not noticing any kind of demonstrable change I think it's worth saying to yourself actually I probably am perimenopausal you know Things are starting to shift. Hormones are starting to kind of taper off or fluctuate. So it's very much a time, I think, to be almost auditing your, mm. your uh, you know, your lifestyle and your nutrition and your health. 
Well, funnily enough, my friend said to me the other day, and I was so thrilled that she'd said it in some respects, because I was like, this means that we're doing the job of education kind of thing. She went, oh, I think I must be perimenopausal because I'm, I'm sure I'm becoming allergic to wine. <laughs> I was like, and, but she, actually, she actually really meant it though. She wasn't like being like flippant. She was like genuinely going, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tailor, like, so I'm going to only drink so many nights a week and I'm going to do this. But I was like, yes, brilliant. Well yeah, good. Yes, we're having this conversation and it's just normal conversation because um, as Lisa said in the in the episode one of this, you know, wine, you do with the histamine, you can develop yes. kind of allergies, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. R- real kind of intolerance, particularly to wine, because you're right, it, it's a real kind of trigger for histamine release. So sadly, that is one of the <laughs> first things and one of the most important things, too, to kind of really get under control or start to kind of minimize and moderate because I see a lot of women, you know, I get women to do like a a four day food diary when we start working together and they will say, you know, you can, you can take things away. You can, you you can do whatever (laughs) you want, but just please leave my wine, which is kind of, you know, I totally get it, but it's bonkers when you are not sleeping, feeling really anxious, uh, you know, putting on weight, all of these things, which actually wine, alcohol really exacerbates. Are there any other foods um, that would exacerbate it? For example, you know, is there anything else that we need to be really aware of? Uh, the consumption, We, I was talking to um, to Dale Pinnock, the medicinal chef, and he was saying, you know, over time, too many refined carbohydrates also bring on lots of different health issues. Are, is this the same? Yeah, so what happens is you become a slightly more insulin resistant as you head into perimenopause. So estrogen is this kind of nice buffer for all different you know, uh, mechanisms in the body uh, and it, it helps with insulin sensitivity. So when it starts to drop, we find, yeah, that we probably don't uh, metabolize refined carbs as well as we used to. So there is definitely, um, you know, an argument to reduce kind of hyper processed foods. We have to be, I think we have to be realistic, you yeah. know, but yes, definitely, definitely something to be aware of, but, you know, erring more towards a kind of Mediterranean style way of eating. So very anti-inflammatory, you know, lots of oily fish, lots of omega-3s, lots of fresh kind of um, plant food sources, not necessarily going vegan by any stretch, but just making sure that you've got lots of color and lots of diversity and lots of fiber. You know, the med diet is really high in fiber. And uh, and most of us in the Western world are eating half of what we should. Uh, and we need fiber. It's not very sexy, is it? But we need, <laughs> it's like the least kind of sexy <laughs> nutrient. But we really, really need it for our gut health. And gut health is huge, isn't it? And so people often don't make that link. They're like, oh, you know, I've got to go and buy these super expensive probiotics. But actually, the best thing you could do for your for your gut microbes is to feed them with fiber. Honestly, that's when I feel my best me. When when my gut is healthy, yeah. I feel like, oh my God, I feel amazing. <laughs> like yeah. it normally happens when I'm on holiday and I'm drinking lots of water and eating lots of fresh produce. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I just I go the other way. You know, some people kind of go for junk food. I'm kind of the opposite. So I know already that if you have like even something like a natural yogurt or something that's got those probiotics in it first thing in the morning even just to help that gut health kind of get going as you said the link between your gut and your brain and your mental health and the things that can really um exacerbate anxiety can often come from food you know what foods can we use to alleviate symptoms if we're getting them early on so you mean alleviate symptoms of, of like hormone fluctuations? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like I said, it's, it's again, it's not a sexy message, but it's about balance. It's about getting lots of, um, you know, just erring away from potentially things like caffeine, which can, you know, for some of us who are really, really sensitive to it, it can cause lots of anxiety. It can really impact sleep. So, you know, just reducing it down, making sure that you're keeping it to the first half of the day. Um and, you know, making sure that you are really looking after your bones. So I've just done an Instagram wow. post today, actually, about bone health, because, again, this is something really we should be talking about in our 20s and 30s. Even my teen girls, you know, I'm often telling them this is the time <laughs> without kind of being alarmist. <laughs> this is the time to really kind of be building up your bone density because it starts to tailor off in your late 20s. So we want to kind of ma- make the most of that window as much as possible by getting lots of calcium in 
Uh, and, you know, if you are taking dairy out, which lots of us are for kind of ethical reasons, or potentially if you're going kind of down the vegan route, then it's, a, you know, it's a big source. It's our most kind of common source of calcium. So we need to be making sure that we're replacing it. Um, so if you're under 50, you're looking at 700 milligrams of calcium a day. If you're over 50, you're looking at 1200. And that's quite a big leap. Yeah. And you really have to kind of be quite focused, uh, you know, and targeted and making sure that you're kind of cramming that into your diet throughout the day. And there's really good um, calcium calculators that you can get online just to give you a kind of idea. There's also an app which I really like called Nutra Check, oh, which yeah. is a... Do you know it? Yeah, it's really good. It's brilliant. So lots of women use it for kind of tracking calories, you know, whatever. If that's your thing, brilliant. But it's very, very good for, you know, we talked Everything. about fiber, for, yeah, calcium, protein. And suddenly you're like, oh, I, I can see, you know, where I'm getting my sources from. And would you recommend then, for example, if people aren't necessarily getting it in their everyday diet, taking a supplement, taking a multivitamin, would that be enough or would you need something extra? So with calcium, you have to be really careful with supplements because it can it can uh, kind of harden your arteries, which obviously is not what we want for heart mm. health. So definitely always, always food first in it for everything. And I will probably talk about supplements because I know lots of, you know, women really want to, they want a magic pill, but always, you know, I would say this because I'm an evidence, you know, I'm <laughs> evidence-based. So it will, we're always looking to get, are kind of you know, to meet our requirements through food ideally and I know that isn't always possible so you know some women will find a multivitamin is a kind of nice buffer mm. if they're stressed or they're busy or they're tired and they just haven't had a chance to cook you know properly for a week or two um, but that said you know multivitamins quite often the dosages are very small mm. so you have to really get a good quality one I think one that's not fill, filled with lots of kind of fillers and, and you know, bulking agents and things like that. Um, but really, try and work on what you're eating. The, the only thing that really we should be supplementing is vitamin D, because obviously in the UK, we're just not getting enough from the sun. I know. <laughs> it makes me so depressed. Um, going back to what you said about, um, you know, being pregnant um, at 14 and going into perimenopause, this is something that a lot of my friends are actually talking about in the sense that some of them are wanting like a second child and they've just turned 40, but then are almost worried about the hormonal impact that that would have. I mean, from your experience and obviously from your professional um, insight, what do you think are the repercussions, so to speak, of the two being so close together? Yeah, it's a great question and it's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? But mm -hmm. obviously, I think if women are wanting to have that child, that's what their kind of focus should be on. But you know, there will be the, the kind of impacts that potentially can happen are things like bone health. Um, they are potentially things like low iron, mm. um, you know, so particularly if you've had quite a few pregnancies kind of back to back, you could get very depleted in things like iron. Um, and also, you know, just the fact that you're not giving yourself that kind of due consideration because you're too busy you know looking after others breastfeeding is also quite uh demanding you know of, of of that goodness too so we really need to be thinking about nourishing and I tell women this doesn't matter how old you are it's about putting stuff in you know really nourishing yourself rather than you know there's this kind of well there's this tendency particularly I think when women start to see that their bodies are changing and this often happens post-pregnancy but mm. it very much happens around the age of 45 you've got this to come mm -hmm. uh you know when you start to see that your body shape is changing because when your estrogen levels drop we lose that kind of hourglass figure and we become a little bit more kind of apple shaped a bit more androgenic you know kind of male mm. it's that male shape um so the instant thing that women will do is to start taking things out and restricting their diets and you know really kind of depriving themselves quite often of things like carbs because carbs are always demonized first when it comes to weight um and that can lead to lots of you know it can lead to poor energy it can mm. lead to hair loss 
Um, it can lead to low mood. So particularly, you know, women who are on things like the keto diet. Yeah. I, I see lots of them coming in and they're really, really flagging. It just doesn't work for um for, for many women, particularly if your hormones are really all over the place and you're stressed. And yeah. you know, it's a stressful time of life. And this is the thing I, I was thinking is like the um obviously you you know, we hear about um postpartum depression when you've had a baby and then if you're going in straight into maybe perimenopause those symptoms as well like mentally could be could be difficult but they don't have to be difficult I think as you're saying and kind of what I wanted to bring from this conversation was that by putting the right things in by prepping ourselves kind of early on we've got we've got then the energy and the tools and we've primed ourselves to be able to do these things almost kind of yeah, back to back, I suppose, and be able to manage it probably yeah. better than women before us because there wasn't as much education in this area. So it is very much about starting those lifestyle changes early, isn't it? Kind of even from your 30s onwards to start looking after yourself. I'd say mid 30s, that mm -hmm. is the time when you really need to be, you know, monitoring your periods, tracking them. So, you know, you know, you are your best kind of advocate for your own health. You know your body better than anybody else. So, you know, when things feel a bit off uh, and tracking your periods for, for, for lots of women, period changes are the first kind of sign that things are starting to um, to move, you know, progesterone starts dipping, estrogen starts kind of fluctuating quite wildly. So you're right, though, there is this kind of quite, uh, there's a crossover between mm. things like PMS, PMDD, postnatal depression, and perimenopause symptoms. Um, so quite often, women who have a propensity to you know, hormone dysregulation, things like PMS, or if they did suffer from postpartum depression, they might be, might be, it's not, it's not, you know, guaranteed, but they might be more at risk of kind of feeling, uh, feeling those symptoms of perimenopause quite, you know, in, in a more of a kind of serious or severe way than, than other women. It's something to be aware of, definitely. I think that, I think it's something to be aware of. It's something to not be frightened of. Yeah. No, you know, don't be frightened of it at all because there's, there's so much out there to help, but I think it's about knowing and being aware and therefore being able to go, actually, I might need a little bit of extra yeah. help. And that's the thing that I think I particularly I would like to get across is that, you know, we, we shouldn't put these things off because we should just know and have the tools around us to be able to kind of manage it. Yeah. And being kind to yourself, you know, really knowing how you work and, 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 and yeah, being kind, I think is, is really key and not compare. It's really difficult. Uh, you know, it's really easy to compare yourself to other people and think, God, you know, she's kind of bossing it. She's just mm. gliding through this, this stage, whatever it is, whether it's pregnancy or, you know, postpartum or perimenopause or menopause is we, we're very quick, aren't we, to judge ourselves. Um, and it's really very much a time, I think, to be kind of you know, looking after ourselves. And I think a time as well where we have these conversations with men as well, because obviously, you know, we, we I feel so bad for them sometimes because they get left out of the conversation and bringing yeah. people in, bringing, bringing your family in and having this open conversation and topic to discuss is really helpful because not you know it affects everybody that you know if you all live together to be able to kind of go oh okay I'm aware of this I'm aware of that and it's just opening those conversations yeah. isn't it, in talking yes. and making sure that we don't just keep it exclusively just to women yeah yeah we need to open up and invite I think inviting men into that chat is super important whether it's you know your partner or because you know it men are affected by this across all aspects of their life you know they'll be working with people you know they might be married to them uh they might be part of their family and actually what i found is so i've been doing lots of work with people like the body shops they've rolled out this kind of menopause program across you know their whole global network and actually the men once they're involved in the conversation and have been brought in are super uh you know interested in it and they really want to be part of it because keeping them out just just causes you know it has like a really kind of knock-on detrimental effect I think so and I think that it's really important as you say it's that you know it'd be the same with men's mental health obviously we're talking a lot more about that now because for, for men they've not they've not felt 
that well the, it's always been this kind of stigma that if a, if a guy talks you know it's not very masculine and I'm so glad that conversation is changing yeah. as well because that's really important and I think it's the same thing it's you know it's it's just making sure look where we we all exist together we need to be aware of these things and make sure that nobody's kind of suffering in silence really yeah. you know like we've all got the right to kind of be able to exist and do our jobs go to work in a nice environment um, and have that support as well um for things that are, are happening I think it's really important but it's interesting because a lot of women don't recognize that this is happening to them so actually if men are educated sometimes they can kind of you know in, uh, intervene and 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 maybe point them in the right direction so it is it's really important However, it would be, there'd be some women, I think, that would be like, what are you saying? I know. <laughs> you have to do it quite carefully. Like, like, carefully. Diplomatically. Yeah, very diplomatically, because there might be some guys who are like, oh, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> but, you know. Tread that, carefully. Yeah, but that's why I think, again, you know, the fact that if we take away this stigma of, oh, well, this is what it means to be a menopausal woman, is like yes. this idea, then it becomes an easier conversation. I mean, just... There was something I read the other day about the, the role of testosterone during the menopause. Um, is that is that increases? Kind of just talk me through that. Yeah, so it's kind of the un. Uh, it's like the forgotten hormone. We all mm. we often talk about estrogen and progesterone, but you know there's this kind of trio uh, that are super important, and it is you know women produce lots of lots of testo- testosterone. It is converted quite most of it is converted to estrogen uh but it plays a massive role in things like uh your brain function you know concentration focus building muscle um mood bone health so it plays a really really important libido really really important role in you know across a lot of different facets of health women's health um so in terms of you know hormone therapy because it's you can you can build, you, uh, well, you can't build it, but you can, what's the word? You can optimize your mm. testosterone levels by doing things like, you know, making sure that you're exercising and building up lean muscle mass. So making sure that you're strength training or using body weight or strength bands um, in your kind of exercise practice. But it is also part of hormone therapy. So women will be given estrogen and progesterone. And then for some women, it's like the cherry on the cake. It's that little bit that's kind of missing. So most GPs, uh, you know, you will have to have started on your estrogen and progesterone journey on that HRT journey. And then it might be something that you can add in later. Now, it isn't sadly a uh, prescribed very often by GPs so quite often you will have to go to a menopause clinic or pay to go privately um I've actually got some right here so it is so you can get this is the male this is male testosterone but women it can be prescribed by GPs uh and you would use a tiny tiny amount it's like a pea-sized amount it's called Tostran this one it's it's just amazing though like I again for like hormone like HRT again I have this kind of preconceived idea that it's this awful thing and that, you know, you you have to walk around with patches on and, and it's so different now, isn't it? It's not actually, there's so, so many different variations and different ways of getting it into your system. I mean, just again, talk me through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, there's lots of, you know, for estrogen, you will have, uh, there's gels, there's sprays, there are patches. The patches, you know, some of them are tiny. Uh, but, you know, there'll be lots of different, uh, there's lots of different preparations and it just depends what works for you. Some women find that they don't actually absorb that well through the skin. So they might find that a spray is better. There is oral uh, oral estrogen too. And then in terms of progesterone, you can use either the marina coil or uh, again, a micronized progesterone, which is body identical and which is taken orally. So yeah, you know, it is, it, it can fit into your into your kind of day so surreptitiously. It, it doesn't have to be a big deal, and nobody needs to know. Not that you need to keep it quiet, but you know, it, it's it's just it's it's part and parcel of of lots of women's everyday life these days. And you mentioned earlier, you know, about like loss of libido, and I know that that's a big thing for a lot of women and for a lot of couples. You know that that, that there's this kind of 
weird like what what's going on there's there's like do you not find me attractive anymore yeah. or things like that and what can we do to kind of you know naturally um just increase our libido you know we know that there's certain foods that help but but you know seriously what what can we do <laughs> yeah I don't you can have all the oysters in the world but yeah. if you're not feeling it uh you know if that desire isn't there it's it's really multifactorial and I think women's libido is very different to men's right we're kind of much more cerebral in the way that we get turned on uh, and that we kind of feel in the mood so it is I think there's lots of different ways that you could do it we write about it in the book actually there's a whole chapter Um, it might be couples therapy it might be just having counseling on your own I think for lots of women it's really painful so you know there's a kind of functional thing happening with their with things like vaginal dryness so again, this can happen to younger women. We think of it as being like something that's only going to happen in our, you know, 60s, 70s. But I see lots of women who find it really hard to ride a bike or wear jeans. You know, some women are finding it really uncomfortable just wiping themselves after going to the toilet uh, because there's this kind of estrogen is, is really helpful for making things plump and and juicy and dewy you know we feel it in our skin uh quite often when those level levels start to drop we feel it in our eyes so you get dry eyes and you get vaginal dryness but again it's such a quick fix vaginal dryness is so easily um you know turned around with uh, just a localized estrogen so anybody you know it's, it's super super safe women who've had um cancer can use it you know very very safely Um, And it comes in lots of different preparations. It's a cream that you might put on your vulva. It's a pessary that you can insert internally. Um, And it's, you know, it's it's something definitely that we we should be talking more about because there's lots of women really, really suffering. And men too, if if you're, you know, if you're in a heterosexual relationship, or, or, you know, even if you're not, vaginal dryness is is going to be, it's, it's going to really impact your well-being. That totally. And uh, uh, we had um, Georgia Dematos on, who um, is the iPlay Safe founder, and we talk about sexual wellness and how often that one, that pillar is ignored. It's like, particularly in this country, like she's Brazilian and she was just saying, you know, culturally, sex is such a big part of cu- culture and well being and health for, for her, kind of. And I, I agree. I think we ignore that part. Are we like, oh, you know, it's a bit yeah, spicy. Can't talk like, about that. Let's not talk about that. But it's such a huge part of our well being as human beings. It's part of our makeup. And so to kind of start to lose that side of us, and particularly when we are living differently now, you know, what was. 50 you know or even 20 years ago is very different to what it is now and it's not a side that we need to necessarily lose and personally I feel really excited that we've got all these things available to us to kind of you know make this transition in the next phase of our life so much more fruitful there's there's like really interesting people you know on Instagram you know like the sex doctor who has these brilliant tutorials there's lots of apps you know, there's lots of different ways I think that women can try and reignite that libido. Um, there are sex toys, you know, which I think we used to think of them as being like, I don't know, these <laughs> huge <laughs> dildos or something. But, you know, they are really neat little bullets now that you can get. There's like clitoral stimulators. And you're right, it's so important for you know, for your happiness, for it could really help with sleep, for, you know, it releases endorphins. So orgasms really should be on prescription. <laughs> this, that is definitely going to be the soundbite for this. A repeat prescription. Um, just, you know, just just going, kind of moving on just a little bit. Um, it's, it's reported, um, and this has happened to a couple of friends of mine, that um, a surgically induced menopause can be much more aggressive in terms of its symptoms, you know. So again, what what would you say to somebody kind of in this period now? Like, would would it be a selection of all the things we've talked about? Or is there any, what, what would be your advice in this area? My advice in, is definitely that women aren't getting looked after well enough when they've been through surgical menopause. They're very often not told what's going to happen. And quite often it can happen overnight. Mm. Uh, and so it doesn't, I, I'm not sure the symptoms are necessarily more aggressive, but they probably feel it because mm. A, these women aren't prepared and B, they're coming a, a kind of, you know, it's an onslaught rather than this kind of slow 
gradual increase. So yeah, I think women have to, it's sadly because, you know, this kind of women's health is just so under uh, diagnosed, you know, under researched, under reported, under recognized, all of those things. So it's very much about advocating for yourself and, and trying to get as much information as possible you know, lots of women just simply aren't told that this is going to happen. And even if you've had a hysterectomy uh, and your ovaries have been left um, intact, sometimes this can this can bring on menopausal symptoms too. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's very much all of these things are super important to to know about and just to make sure that you're getting evidence based information. I think it's probably worth talking to you know, a specialist in that, in this area, if that is you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and going back to, you know, more of kind of your, your food side of the work that you do and the, the brilliant recipes that you have, you know, are there any standout foods for you that you think, yes, actually we should all be, we've talked obviously about the, the minerals, but just like actual everyday foods that you, we should be topping up on that we're probably not. I think, and I'm a big advocate of this, so people are like, oh, God, she's talking about it again, but protein. Women aren't eating enough protein. They're not starting their day with, you know, a decent chunk of protein in their breakfast, whenever that is. So they are then feeling really, really tired, and they are getting cravings. They're feeling hangry. Uh, They're not filling themselves up. Protein is the most satiating macronutrient there is. So, you know, it it wins and we need it for for building every single cell in our body. So it's a real kind of win-win. And you are looking at about a gram per kilogram of body weight a day spread out because you can only absorb so much, you know, about 20, well, 30 grams per kind of meal. So I, you know, a kind of really ballpark is aiming for 90, let's say 90 grams a day, 30 grams per meal. And you can get it from things like Greek yogurt, eggs, you know, tofu, edamame beans, beans, lentils, peas, that kind of thing. Protein shakes are really helpful. I was just about to say, if you're on the go, if you're an on the go person, yeah. like when I was doing a lot more weight training um, and my trainer was like, you you do not get half the protein that you need. You need this. And I did find that the, the shakes on the go were really helpful Perfect. for me. Yeah. Are they OK? They are yeah. OK then. I think they're brilliant. I think, uh, you know, it's not necessary. If you can get them, you get your protein in without them, brilliant. But yeah, I think they're really convenient uh, and you know exactly what's going into them. Whereas some women are like, oh, you know, how much protein is there in an egg? So you've kind of got to work it all out. But with protein, you look at the label on the back uh, and there's lots of different types, right? There's there's lots, there's lots vegan protein, there's whey, there's all of these different types that you can, you know, try and see what works for you. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan. And it's really, as you said before, it's it's like the building blocks for lean muscle, and yeah. which is kind of as we as we age, that's really what we need. Yeah, it starts to really taper off your 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 muscle mass as we get older. And when I'm saying older, I'm kind of talking late thirties, you know, early forties. So it's very much something to be aware of. And your it has a kind of knock on effect. You know, the amount of uh, muscle mass that you have, like I said, with insulin sensitivity, with bone health. And just feeling uh, with weight. So it really is, I think, one of the most important uh, nutrients there is. But like you said, lots of women aren't getting enough. I think particularly at breakfast and lunch. So if you're having that 3 p.m. slump that we quite often do, you know, when your your mm. eyes are hanging out your head, <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, how am I going to get through the rest of the day? Invariably, it's because you've had a sandwich for lunch and it just, you know, your 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 Sugar, blood sugar levels have gone up and then they've kind of slumped uh, and you're slumping as a result and the thing is though is like I know there are so many women like me though that feel like if you for example had um eggs and meat which would be brilliant and kind of pr- very protein high they don't feel full in a weird way or they don't feel like they've had the the stodge of it and we've got to change that mindset do you know what I mean it's really, really hard to overeat protein because it feel it fills you right up. It, you know, it's got four uh, calories per gram. It's one of the lowest kind of calorie dense foods, but it's energy dense. So, you know, it, it really, yeah. I, I, and also I think women do, we associate it with steak, don't we? And things like that. But there's lots of different protein yeah. sources, tempeh, tofu, seitan, you know, corn, all of these things, edamame beans, they're all really good sources. 
Oh yeah, I mean, we'll do a. I'll do a whole other podcast again on that next next series. And um, but just before we finish up, I'd just like to know what your top well being practice or product is for our well being capsule. <gasps> That's such a good question. Um, it wouldn't actually be. It's not food related. For, I think for doesn't matter who you are, what how old you are. I think for women, there's it's a really important to start investing in yourself. You know, start saying no to things that you don't want to do. Stop spreading yourself so thin, if possible. I know it isn't always. Um, because by giving and giving and giving, which I think women do have this kind of propensity to do, basically, we're just leaving nothing in the tank for ourselves. And that, I think, is when quite often things start to, you know, we start to topple over and we start to kind of really feel like we're not, you know, tolerating these symptoms very well. So that would be my thing. Start saying no more. Start being selfish. Oh, yes. I love that. Oh, Emma, I'm so sorry. We've sadly run out of time for today. But honestly, thank you so much for being with me. You have been an absolute fountain of knowledge. So it's been brilliant. It's been lovely chatting. Thanks for having me. I hope you guys at home have enjoyed our conversation and that it's given you some really helpful advice. For more brilliant information from Emma, you can find her at www.emmabardwell.com and on Instagram at emma.bardwell. You can also find The Perimenopause Solution in all good bookshops and online. Another one for your reading list if you want to get ahead. This is, is such an amazing book filled with so many brilliant things and pieces of information, so definitely go and get it. As always, for more well-being, fashion and beauty, you can visit us at our website, www.thecapsule.co.uk, where you can also catch up with our previous podcast episodes by subscribing to our YouTube and podcast channels. It would be lovely to hear your thoughts as always, so please do feel free to leave us your rates and reviews. If you're a social butterfly, you all know this. You can catch us on Instagram and Facebook at Official Capsule. I will be back next week for our final week of Series 5 with another wonderful guest so all that's left for us to say today is goodbye so it's goodbye from emma bye and goodbye from me this episode of the capsule in conversation was brought to you by harrogate spring water bottled at source harrogate spring offers a pure refreshing taste with a delicate blend of naturally occurring minerals and electrolytes perfect for healthy hydration